This is continuing coverage of the trial of Karen Reed from the Hidden Killers podcast and True Crime Today. Now, back to the courtroom. See how things develop beforehand. So, Mr. Yanetti, I, I can tell you right now, I'm not going to allow you to open on this because I need to see how the evidence comes in. It's not part of my opening. Okay. Um, who would you intend? I see you have the La Polito brothers on the witness list. I think that goes far further than I would allow. But who do you intend to get the testimony in through and how? Through Sergeant Lang himself. I think okay. we need to be afforded the ability to cross-examine him. Um, once that's done, we may need um, the if, local if he denies to, it, and, and we'll exactly. figure we'll figure that out. But, but I think but. the first step is allowing us to inquire as to his relationships and the connection that he has to the family and this incident that occurred. So you can certainly inquire as to his relationship with the family. It's the incident. I need to see my again, just reading of everything that I've read. Um, Sergeant Lank doesn't have it, his testimony isn't as lengthy as other witnesses, right? I, I don't think that that's necessarily true, Your Honor, as far Mr. as our cross-examination. Okay, but for his direct is not as lengthy as other witnesses. I think that's fair to say. Yeah. So, so, all right, so go ahead. So through him, um, through Chris Albert? Through him, potentially through Chris Albert as well, Your Honor. Okay. All right. So, um, uh, Mr. Yanetti's not going to open on this, and he said he wasn't planning on it anyway. So, no, yeah. let's see how the evidence develops. It may be that we have a voir dire of Sergeant Lank and Chris Albert beforehand. Okay, so um, I'm not going to take any action on this right now. Okay, but I'm not. I'm not denying it as the Commonwealth's requesting me to do. Thank you. So Your Honor. we'll we'll see where we go with this. Okay. All right. So now let's. Ju- deal with the Trooper Proctor part? So, Trooper Proctor, Your Honor, in regard to NEI investigation, uh, which uh, we have not received any material in regard to other than its existence. And and I want to be clear on that because I think counsel might be a little confused by some material that we provided to them. Uh, so there were some interviews in regard to any sort of areas of potential bias uh, with regard to Trooper Proctor and certain members of the Albert family. That was something that we did. Uh, so we had uh, asked and uh, a couple of uh, captains from the state police who are completely divorced from the investigation and completely divorced from our office uh, conducting interviews with uh, regard to Trooper Proctor and a few of the other uh, civilian witnesses. Okay. In, in How recently? I mean, it's all recent. When, when was that? Uh, that was, uh, I think, all discovery related to that was provided to counsel um, the week prior to trial. Okay. Uh, but they were done sort of in the weeks leading up to that. Is that part complete? Yes. Okay. Uh, so as far as the IA investigation goes, uh, just the mere fact that there is an IA investigation, the Commonwealth would submit is not an, an appropriate uh, area for cross-examination, and particularly uh, when it's an open investigation, there are no findings and uh, falls squarely within uh, McFarland and, and Graham. And I understand what the courts um, comments before about, you know, them being primarily discovery cases, and I would agree with that. Uh, but they also go to discovery cases as far as what, so if something can't be ordered to be provided in the course of discovery, then it's, I, I would submit inferentially inadmissible. Uh, so what I'm suggesting with this motion, what I'm arguing in this motion, is that whereas there is no uh, findings of liability, there's no findings of any wrongdoing or anything of that ilk, just sort of putting out there that there's an open IA investigation without anything more because nothing else exists at this point. Uh, why, assume- why wouldn't it go to his bias and his motive? He, you know, if he's being, if he's under investigation... Why wouldn't he have the motive to testify favorably, or why why doesn't it go to that? Maybe not the the fact that it's IAD, but just there's an ongoing investigation that he's aware of, that he's involved, uh, and you know, I don't know if his job depends on it. I don't know that. Maybe there's not enough to know. But why isn't that motive and bias on his part? Uh, do you think that's prohibited by Graham and McFarland? I do, um, and and just for that specific, because essentially what what it allows a defendant to do is to pursue a line of questioning that they have no idea what that line of questioning is or what it will eventually be, and it could <clears throat> eventually turn into 
nothing. Um, and to allow that sort of um, imprimatur of the court uh, to, to allow that sort of questioning into an area that is completely unsettled and completely, um, there's no evidence uh, to substantiate other than the fact that it, it exists um, without any sort of uh, finding, without any sort of uh, evidence to support it. I mean, that there's, we don't have any evidence as far as what that is or, or, or that it even pertains to this case. Uh, so with regard to uh, all of that, I, I understand, you know, that outside of McFarland and outside of Graham that there are other uh, avenues, as the court was alluding to, as far as motive, as far as bias, as far as things of that nature. But when it's just so scant as far as what that is it versus sort of the connotation behind uh, those questions. Um, I, I, I just think it's unfair uh, to the Commonwealth, it's unfair to the witness uh, to be put in that position when there's really no information available. All right, what do you say, Ms. Little? Your Honor, I think that ADA Lally's representation that we don't know what this investigation is about is disingenuous, to say the least. Why so? Why? Is Reason there something is, in the, hold on, is it something in the information that you've received? Yes, Your Honor. From and Mr. Lally? Yes, Your Honor. All right, so um, can I get a copy of that? Yes, Your Honor. Okay. So, as the court knows, first of all, Grimm and McFarland deal with the Commonwealth's mandatory discovery obligations, right? Those courts also very specifically state that there's mechanisms outside of those mandatory discovery obligations for defendants to obtain information that's relevant and admissible at trial. That's why we filed a Rule 17 motion requesting these disciplinary records, and that's why that was granted. Uh, it was granted because the Commonwealth did not object. So regardless, we've obtained those records, and the cases that Mr. Lally continues to cite do not stand for the proposition that that's the only mechanism by which information can be produced at trial. Those are discovery cases. They are not admissibility cases. Um, Pursuant to that request, we have received information discussing the IA investigation at which Trooper Proctor is being questioned specifically about this case. Um, this is not an instance where we're questioning whether or not there's a basis for an IA investigation. It's clear this investigation was predicated on the materials that were produced to the Commonwealth by the federal authorities in this case. And initiated by the Commonwealth. The IAD investigation was initiated by the DA's office, correct? Well, as far, and, and just to correct what I, I, I certainly didn't mean to impute that, that this case had absolutely no bearing or there was no I, I didn't. For I that. didn't think you did. Um, but what I was saying with that is we don't know what the full extent of that is. But as far as what counsel is, uh, what the court's question as far as the IAD, uh, it was something that uh, our office had spoken to. Uh, we felt we had a duty to uh, disclose the state police legal counsel, and then they refer it to the IA, and that's how that investigation began. As it pertains to what counsel is talking about, that has nothing to do with IA. So the, the materials that the Commonwealth has provided, that was completely separate uh, investigation initiated by the district attorney's office. Okay. For that. Okay. The IA investigation came on the heels of this information being produced to the Commonwealth. This is not a situation in which we're, we're really questioning what the basis of that investigation is. The Commonwealth has in its possession numerous materials that suggest there has been significant misconduct on the part of Trooper Proctor. That will come out at trial. Um, How? However, How? Through cross-examination. What if they don't call Trooper Proctor? We will call Trooper Proctor. To impeach him? Yes. All right, so be prepared to argue that. I don't know. He's on the witness list. He's the first person on the witness list. They're probably calling him. I'm just He's the hypothetically lead detective in this case. He's conducted every single step of this investigation. With others, right? Excuse me? With others? Sometimes. Sometimes, but he, he is the primary investigator in this case. Um, and I think it's very, very important for the court, and I think you noted correctly that Bias and motive are absolutely critical to, to Ms. Reed's right to defend herself at trial. We have to be able to explore those issues. Um, and in order for Trooper Proctor to testify, he has a motivation to testify in a certain way to avoid liability in this pending IA investigation. So I, I think it's, it's unfair to, to, 
tie our hands behind our back and not be able to question him about this because it directly drives his bias and motive in this case and gives him reason to testify in a certain way, um, knowing that he could he could face career consequences if he doesn't. Do you intend to try and open on this, Ms. Gianetti? Because I need more information. I'm not going to mention the IA investigation in my okay. statement. All right. So, Ms. Talali, if you can get me that information that you mentioned that you sure. had sent to counsel, I'll take a look at that. Uh, it may well be the fact that there's an investigation without what the nature of the investigation is, but that there's an important investigation, and if you can show me in advance that his job may depend on it, things of that nature, there may be um, cleaner ways to allow this testimony in. So, all right, so we need um, we need a little time. I need to read those materials. Sure. And, okay. and for the court's edification, I, I don't anticipate he's sort of towards the middle, I would say. Okay. So. All right. Good. And the, the more fully the record's developed and the easier to rule on some of these motions. I just want to give you all some ideas so you know how to prepare for the next two weeks. So, um, all right. So not in your openings on either one of these, Ms. Giannetti, but you agree to that. So this is still under advisement. It may be certainly with Lank um, or Sergeant Lank uh, of voir dire of Sergeant Lank and of voir dire of Chris Albert. We'll see how the evidence develops, and I'll, I'll read more about the information that the Commonwealth has provided. So 318, also it's 28 bolded from the Commonwealth. All right, so Commonwealth's motion in limine to admit, this is, you know what, I don't have a number on this one, Jim. Um, Commonwealth's motion in limine to admit results of defendant's blood draw at Good Samaritan Hospital and resulting serum conversion and retrograde extrapolation. Judge, that's paper 339. All right, and the Commonwealth, I mean, the defendant's is 289. It's the, the addressing the same. The same issues. Yeah, I, I told the Commonwealth to put this in writing. So I guess it's defendant's motion. So I'll, I'll hear from the defense. Your motion 289. Thank you, Your Honor. Um, with regard to that, we've put most of our argument in the, the paper, so I don't want to rehash all of those. The issue is really the foundational issue, uh, not the extrapolation. The extrapolation is sort of a... It's a Sort of a garbage in, garbage out argument, like computers. Uh, we think that the underlying uh, blood draw did not follow the proper protocols that it should have followed. Therefore, the veracity of that particular blood draw is an issue. Right. Can, can I just ask? The Commonwealth intends to have witnesses here to testify to that, right? How yes. the blood was drawn, the, the, yes, all of the that. Commonwealth would have the doctor that ordered it, the blood draw, the nurse uh, slash nurse practitioner, I summons both um, as far as who took the blood and then uh, the director of the lab at the Good Samaritan Medical Center. Okay. What I hope to... So, so let me get back to Mr. Jackson and then I'll hear you on that. I just wanted that. I'm not sure we had all that information when you filed the motion, but does that change anything, Mr. Jackson? It doesn't because the individuals that did the blood draw, it wasn't done in an accredited manner. Uh, I'm not arguing with the fact that the blood draw was taken, that somebody with uh, a phlebotomist actually took the blood, but it wasn't done with the protocols or the accreditation that's required under Massachusetts state law and the Massachusetts State Police Crime Lab. Their protocols were, <clears throat> I apologize, their protocols were breached internally, and given that breach, we believe that any extrapolation based or founded upon those, um, those faulty blood draws, those unaccredited blood draws, uh, are suspect as well. So um, the, the sum and substance is that you can't trust the extrapolation if it wasn't an accredited uh, and, a, and a foundationally solid blood draw to begin with. So if, if all the witnesses are here for cross-examination, why doesn't that go to the weight of the evidence instead of the admissibility? Because we think that the admissibility is based on the, the protocols that the Massachusetts State Police have, have put in pl place. If they didn't have accreditation protocols, it wouldn't mean anything. It probably would go to the weight, not the admissibility. 
I think the admissibility is predicated on their own rules. They don't get, in our view, they don't get to break their own rules and then say, oh, well, let's just let it go to the weight, not the admissibility. We believe that it's important enough that it shouldn't ever come in front of the jury in the first place, notwithstanding the fact that we could obviously cross-examine them on the, the lack of accreditation. We think that it rises to, to the next level of not being trustworthy, and therefore it's overly prejudicial. Okay. Um, Mr. Lally, doesn't this happen in hospitals across Massachusetts on a regular basis? It does, and just to be clear, nobody's breaking anybody's own rules. This wasn't uh, blood work that was taken by anybody at the lab or tested at the lab. It was taken at the hospital, tested at the hospital, and what the um, technician or the forensic scientist from the Office of Alcohol Testing is doing is essentially mathematical calculations based on that result. Uh, so I would submit it goes exactly uh, to the weight of the evidence. It's certainly a fertile ground for cross-examination or argument by counsel. Uh, but as far as it being admissible, it's, it's certainly admissible. This is what happens in every case. Whether or not Good Samaritan Medical Center's lab is, is ANAB accredited or anything of that nature is, is irrelevant. It, it has nothing to do with the state police strictures because they're not the ones who actually conducted the testing of, of what was in the blood. All right, do you want to respond? I just wanted to ref uh, refresh the court's recollection. I mentioned this at the last hearing, but just one element of the problem is in the result. The extrapolated result was 124% swing. In other words, we extrapolated based on the blood draw. Yeah, I, I know what it means. And that's just massive. I've never seen any a swing that big. It's, you know, you pull somebody over. Well, they Sounds have like a great area for cross-examination. I think it will be. Okay. Uh, but if it's not admissible in the first place because it's inherently untrustworthy, then you could save me my breath. <laughs> yeah. I, I don't see how this doesn't come in. I, our, I'll submit, I don't want to beat a dead horse, I just think that it's, it's so unreliable that it shouldn't be put before the jury, and, and we, we run the risk of prejudicing the jury in a way that we can't sort of unring that bell. Yes, we can cross-examine, but I, I don't think that the, the underlying blood draw is foundationally solid enough. Mr. Lally, were you planning on using this in your opening? I don't have to. All right, so why don't we wait, and uh, if need be, um, we'll have... A I mean, the experts, the, let's wait until it gets closer to these experts or the, the folks from the hospital testifying. If we need to have a short voir dire, you need to remind me to do that, Mr. Jackson, okay? okay. Thank you for that, Your Honor. Appreciate it. All right. Okay. So the last area I have is sort of logistics and sequestration. Um, So let me. So the Commonwealth filed a motion initially. You know what? We'll hold off on the uh, on the logistics regarding the audiovisual assistant. So there was a motion in limine for sequestration that I allowed regarding the family. So the. Um, Victim's brother, Paul O'Keefe, the sister-in-law, Erin O'Keefe, um, the niece and nephew, can attend the trial after their testimony. So that motion 293 is allowed. I understand that perhaps, well, I was going to also allow Mr. O'Keefe's father, who appears for some reason on the defendant's witness list. Uh, he is exempt also. Um, by me from the sequestration order. All right, so um, that's John O'Keefe Sr. So I, I just added that in. So uh, Mr. Clerk, 293 is allowed with the addition of Mr. O'Keefe Sr. So the, the Commonwealth has filed a, a two-part motion, a motion for offer of proof regarding calling the elected sitting district attorney of Norfolk County um, and sequestration order um, if he is permitted to be called. Uh, the, this also includes Stephen Nelson, who is the victim witness person. So why don't I hear you, Mr. Lally or Ms. McLaughlin? I'll hear you on this motion. 
Uh, yes, Your Honor. So the reason for this motion is, as the court um, noted, they appear on the defendant's witness list. Neither of them, I believe, has received a summons uh, in regard to it, so that's, there's no motion to quash because there's no summons to quash. Um, but with respect to each, uh, as uh, the case law is abundantly clear, um, in order for these uh, witnesses um, from a prosecution team to be Subject to uh, being called as witnesses by the defense, uh, the Commonwealth is just seeking some sort of proffer whatsoever as to what areas they can testify and to and only they can testify to. So if, if it's information that the defendant can elicit either through direct testimony or cross-examination uh, from, and I would submit uh, whatever, I, I would believe uh, that whatever testimony uh, they seek from either of these witnesses, uh, they could get ample uh, testimony from a multitude of other witnesses. Specifically, the only point uh, that was raised uh, as sidebar during uh, impanelment was with reference to the district attorney uh, testifying as to uh, whatever issues uh, reported issues of, of conflict or removal of Can Police Department from the investigation, uh, certainly those are questions I think far more appropriate uh, for members of both the Can Police Department, members of uh, the State Police CPAC uh, Detective Unit. Uh, the head of that unit, Lieutenant Tully, is one of the commonwealth witnesses who will be testifying, and I think he's in a far better position to testify to that than, than Mr. Morrissey. But regardless of that, uh, what the case law is, is very clear about is, is that, number one, uh, the victim witness advocate is a part of the prosecution team and in these sort of areas stands in sort of the same stead uh, as a prosecutor himself. Secondly, uh, with respect to whatever areas of, of examination are expected or anticipated uh, from these two uh, witnesses, there has to be some sort of proffer of, of what that anticipated testimony would be that they can't get from some other witness. Um, certainly, Mr. Nelson has been uh, the victim and his advocate uh, working on this case. So why don't you explain to me, I did look at the victim's bill of rights, but why don't you explain to me exactly what a victim witness advocate does, the nature of uh, the relationship with the victim's family. I know there was a lot of discussion about this in grand jury minutes that I read about scheduling appointments, meeting with people, things of that nature. So, I, I mean, what the... The, uh, to say assist, I, I think, is, is doing it somewhat of a disservice as far as the prosecution. It's, it's someone who works directly uh, with the prosecutor on virtually every step of, of the case, as far as investigation, as far as uh, pending motions, as far as trial. Um, Has Mr. Nelson been the advocate throughout the the pendency of this case? Yes, Your Honor. So for over two years. Uh, has been the point of contact with the family, uh, has been with the family at each of the court dates, uh, is... Uh, assistant and very helpful as far as coordinating things uh, with the family, coordinating meetings, uh, scheduling meetings with witnesses uh, in preparation of grand jury, in preparation of uh, trial, um, has uh, communicated thoroughly with re regard to issues of scheduling and all of those types of things. Does he take calls like late at night from witnesses? Does he have a personal relationship with witnesses? Um, governed by a professional relationship? Is he somebody that they are able to call? There, there's been a lot of allegations of harassment of witnesses. Correct. Are those folks able to call him when something like that happens? That is the person that they would call. Okay. Um, yes. So so I, I think the bulk of the communications and conversations with witnesses who are not members of uh, Mr. O'Keefe's family uh, over the course of the last couple of years have been in relation to that issue specifically as far as uh, harassment, threats, intimidation, things of that nature uh, that that he's uh, dealt with admirably in, in relation to those witnesses. Okay. All right. Who's arguing this for the defense? I will, Your Honor. Uh, and I think it makes sense to separate out D.A. Morrissey and victim witness advocate Steve Nelson in okay. this, in this let's argument. Okay. Let's start with uh, Mr. Nelson. Sure. Uh, so, uh, Your Honor, uh, the defense acknowledges that uh, there are often times where, let's say, a victim witness advocate sits in on an interview uh, with a, a witness or an alleged victim, but there are other witnesses in the room to whom 
uh, or who could testify about the content of that, and that doesn't necessarily make it proper to call a victim witness advocate during a trial. I acknowledge that. Um, I also acknowledge that uh, the victim witness advocate has a, a job to do, and it puts them uh, as sort of an intermediary between the prosecutors and the police uh, and alleged victims. So when you were a prosecutor, you, had, you worked very closely with victim witness I advocates. Did. I did. Okay. Yes, and that's, it's my experience being on the other side that informs my knowledge of that. Uh, but this is a different case uh, with regard to one specific issue, uh, and that is that uh, we learned as a result of the federal materials that victim witness advocate Steve Nelson had conversations with uh, Brian Higgins, uh, and we believe Brian Albert, but Brian Higgins uh, uh, talked about him specifically. Uh, uh, Mr. Higgins was uh, asked, where is his cell phone? Why does he not have it? Are you aware of the preservation order that was issued by Judge Krupp uh, in the Karen Reed case? And the answer came back that he was given permission to uh, destroy or dispose of his cell phone from victim witness advocate Steve Nelson. Did he say destroy? I, I'm trying to remember the well, testimony. I, 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 I don't think he said destroy. I used the disjunctive rather than the conjunctive because I, I, from memory I can't remember the precise language, but it certainly it was uh, conveyed to... I'm told that the precise language was to get rid of. Uh, which, you know, would be consistent with what I had told said. Told he could get rid of, not right. told he must get rid of? Co correct. In other words, uh, Steve Nelson is overruling a colleague of yours, your predecessor on this case, who issued a preservation order which was never lifted. And yet he stepped into the case, uh, gave uh, authorization that he did not have to give for the disposal of a phone, which is relevant. Okay, is, is that the sole issue you want to... Yes. The sole issue. Yes, that's with regard to Mr. Nelson. It's different with regard to Mr. Right, Morris. What's the Commonwealth's response to that? I, I don't believe any of that is accurate. Uh, so what, what counsel is referring to is there was a motion to preserve cell phones. Uh, the Commonwealth notified each of the witnesses that were subject to the motions and the orders, sent copies of the motions and the orders, as well as a letter explaining that. There were conversations in regard to that. There was then a subsequent Rule 17 motion filed specifically for the physical phones. Uh, there were conversations with those specific witnesses, just advising them that the Rule 17 motion had been filed. They had to you know, hold on to their phones, things of that nature, explaining what the process was. The hearing was conducted, uh, the Rule 17 motion was denied, uh, and then those witnesses were subsequently informed that the motion had been denied. Um, I believe even from Mr. Higgins' testimony uh, in the federal grand jury uh, that counsel is referring to, he was specifically asked whether or not uh, he had been ever advised by Mr. Nelson, myself, or anyone from our office uh, that he could or should get rid of his phone, and he said no. Uh, so I, I don't know what further needs to be explored on that particular point, uh, as the question was, all of these issues were, were explored in that particular area, and just because counsel, I think, may not like the answer or doesn't believe that the answer is truthful or whatever, that does not then permit bringing in this witness to testify to what they know is not true. All right, so Ms. Tianetti? Um, we believe that that's a misstatement of what was testified to. I think it probably makes sense for this court to look at his very testimony so that you can make a decision on this, Your yeah. Honor. So here's, here's what I'm going to do. Let's wait and see. Let's wait and see how... Uh, Mr. Higgins testifies, okay? I am not going to um, order sequestration uh, of Mr. Nelson, and let's see how the testimony is, and if you need to call him, you let me know, and we'll have another hearing on it. Okay, we will do, and uh, just to answer an anticipated question from the court, I do not open on this issue. You either. cannot open on that issue, Ms. <laughs> Dianetti. Do you still need the 45 minutes? <laughs> that, that takes away nothing from yeah. my opening. All right, so Jim, I'll start writing. I'll write something on this. Your Honor, with regard to the sequestration, I think it would be appropriate for the court to order that uh, Mr. Nelson and Mr. Higgins not discuss this issue from here forward. Are you willing to have that happen, Mr. Lally? 
That's fine, Your Honor. Yeah, I'd, I'd order it, but he's willing to do it. So. Thank you. All right, so... Um, I just need a minute to write this up. Sure. All right. So regarding D.A. Morrissey. Yes. Well, thank you, Your Honor. So, Your Honor, the uh, integrity of the investigation that was done in this case is uh, certainly a live and important issue that is part of the defense in this case. I think the court would agree that we're entitled to question the integrity of the investigation, uh, to attack it where we can. Uh, and it goes without saying that as the district attorney in Norfolk County, Michael Morrissey is in charge of that investigation. Now, in the usual case, uh, that doesn't necessarily make a district attorney a witness. That would be unusual. Uh, there probably have been very few requests to have a district attorney testify in that regard. However, this case is different for two reasons. One is the conflict of interest uh, regarding the Canton Police Department, which Mr. Morrissey was involved in. The second is the manner in which he injected himself into this case personally and made representations that we should be allowed to challenge. Do you want to play that video? Uh, we haven't made that decision yet. Uh, it, it may be that we elect to play portions of the video. It may be that we just... Uh, elect to question D.A. Morrissey. I, I have to think of other ways, right? No, that, that's part of the analysis of that course. I have to follow in the law. Uh, uh, so that's why I'm asking. Of course. And, and I, I think before we get to that issue, Your Honor, the, the conflict issue is uh, what puts him on the stand first. Uh, and we learned from the federal materials that former Chief Kenneth Berkowitz notified D.A. Morrissey at a very, very early juncture at 8.30 a.m., uh, a phone call from Chief Berkowitz to D.A. Morrissey notified him that, uh, you know, Kevin Albert is on their force. He's the brother of the homeowner uh, whose uh, lawn contained uh, the uh, lifeless body of John O'Keefe, uh, and that D.A. Morrissey was involved in that decision. To He received the information from uh, former Chief Berkowitz and concurred that the Canton police were conflicted out. And then the problem is that the Canton police were, they had their hands in this investigation, uh, c including that day after 8.30 a.m. and going forward. And there were, uh, you know, updates that were provided to Kevin Albert by a trooper under D.A. Morrissey's control uh, that, you know, there were violations of that sort of conflict of interest taking Canton out of the case that D.A. Morrissey became aware of and that D.A. Morrissey did nothing about. Uh, and so in terms of, uh, you know, us being able to, uh, you know, attack, question the integrity of the investigation. Why can't you do it through other witnesses? We, we can, but the buck stops with District Attorney Michael Morrissey. He was the one that was involved at a very early juncture on this precise issue of the conflict, and he became aware that that conflict was violated time and time and time again, and he did nothing. And I believe that that's ripe for cross-examination. Uh, and, you know, with regard to his statement to the press, uh, this may even be more compelling. Uh, 
not because of the bias necessarily that he showed. That's not the, the, the uh, strongest uh, part. I think it is strong, but it's not the strongest part of his statement. His statement makes factual assertions, uh, some of which we heard for the first time. In, in that videotape statement, he announced to everyone, including potential jurors, that Trooper Proctor never reported to the scene uh, on January 29th. Uh, that's in direct conflict to police reports that we received from the troopers saying that they reported to the scene. And they're, I, I, we would argue, trying to use semantics to get out of that and now saying that for the first time in my career, I've heard that the crime scene is actually the police station that's across town. That doesn't make any sense. It doesn't pass the straight face test. But those are his own words. And he made himself a witness by uttering those words. And he also talked about his view of what witnesses did or didn't do and whether they're suspects or not suspects. Again, he injected himself into this case. He made himself a witness. And there's really nobody else we can question about his knowledge that he had when he made those statements and why he made those statements. And also the fact that, you know, he, he was involved in this conflict decision from the beginning. So that's our offer of proof. Mr. Lally. I mean, as far as his statements, his opinions are completely irrelevant. And I think what counsel is referring to as proper for cross-examination, they might be. Um, but this would be a witness that they're calling themselves. So for direct examination of your own witness, uh, I, I think it's improper, number one. Number two, uh, there is ample other avenues uh, to explore this through other witnesses, uh, which counsel can certainly do, um, you know, as as related to whatever as uh, the, the law tells me i have to consider correct and and so you know as it pertains to whatever extent the court allows uh, as far as the Bowdoin defense is concerned then i i think it's fertile ground for cross-examination of other witnesses in respect to that but as to whatever statements were made or not made uh by something that someone doesn't have percipient knowledge of because i don't think anybody's saying that mr morrissey was at 34 fairview road so with all of those things in, in consideration, I, I, I don't think that it's even close to a valid proffer as to why the district attorney or Mr. Nelson um, need to testify on their own as to any of those things. Um, the last thing I, I would just note is uh, within, with respect to Mr. Nelson, the, uh, the alleged mischaracterization that I made in regard to Mr. Higgins' testimony is actually contained on page 140 of his testimony. 140? One four zero. Could you read it? Do you have it there? Um, if you don't have it there, it, it's more so. I, I don't know that I'm. Okay. To. <laughs> okay. You run. If I could just add one thing that I, I should have mentioned, which is with on this issue of whether there's another issue, uh, another witness that could testify. Yes, because I, because you did say yes, we can get it in through other witnesses. We, yes, except the one thing we can't get in through other witnesses potentially is the phone call from Chief Berkowitz to D. A. Morrissey, where, as I'm understanding it, there were only two people on that call, and the Commonwealth is seeking to take. Chief Berkowitz off the witness stand as well. Are you? I didn't see anything like that. No, I'm not seeking to keep him off the witness stand. What I informed counsel is uh, his, as to his current medical condition, and informed counsel that's why I didn't summons him. Um, but I, I'm not well, seeking. I, I knew nothing about this. Prohibit okay, him yeah. from testifying. My understanding was that he. The, the prosecution didn't believe that he would be able to testify. Oh, this is the first time I'm hearing any of that. All right. So it, it, it is a stretch. It is an uphill battle for you, Mr. Yanetti. I will allow you to revisit the ADA Morrissey at the close of the Commonwealth's case. Uh, right now, that your offer of proof is not enough. I'll give you the opportunity to do it again um, based on the testimony that comes in. And I am not excusing him or it, he is not subject to the sequestration order. Understood, Your Honor. Thank you. Okay. All right. So, um, Jim, I'll write something short on that. I've, I've written the part about Mr. Nelson that I'll give you afterwards. Great. Thank you. All right. So... When we had our 
motion in limine hearing. I think we went much of the day that Friday. I don't remember if it was last Friday or the Friday before. I ended that with um, saying twice, is there anything else we need to discuss regarding housekeeping or logistics? And I was told no by both parties. And then I get a, a motion the following well, April 19th, the, um, the end of last week, about um, wanting to put, wanting to use, not just um, having an audio, a, a technology audio, audio visual assistant at council table, but to use, it, it's much more extensive than what I expected. The Commonwealth filed their motion and it was allowed previously because it happens in every single case in these courtrooms and the Commonwealth shares their equipment. Um, please tell me exactly what it is you want to do and I'm mindful also of the fact that during impanelment while we were actively on trial in this case in a critical part of the case your audiovisual person who I had never seen was sitting where you are Mr. Yanetti talking to your client. Um, so it, it sounds like he's taking liberties in this courtroom and I need to know exactly what you need him for and what it is you intend to do. Keeping in mind also that we're going to be now in a much smaller courtroom. So tell me, are there any agreements of counsel? Is there any, I know nothing about this and I asked for information previously so I could have thought about it and you know, seen a demonstration or heard something. What is it you're asking me to allow? Thank you, Your Honor. Uh, it's, it's very modest. Uh, we did mention uh, that we were going to ask for this. Uh, uh, but you didn't do it in writing and you didn't give me specifics. Your Honor, we asked you and you then said put it in writing, then we put it in writing. I mean, but the first exactly time it was brought up was after I had asked about logistics. Go ahead, tell me exactly what it is you want to do. Okay, so it's a very modest request. Uh, under ordinary circumstances, and we've utilized his services before, uh, he would sit at council table and he would run sort of the AV to make it seamless and smooth for everybody, for the jurors, for the court, for the court reporter, for uh, opposing counsel. Um, he can put monitors at the request of the court, put monitors on the bench, a monitor in front of the uh, court reporter, a monitor in front of uh, the Commonwealth and a monitor here, all small, relatively inobtrusive monitors. He also can run the, the system of AV, of, in other words, putting up evidence. I'm looking at evidence binders that Mr. Lally and I are going to be visiting about through the day today and tomorrow. Uh, there's hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of photographs in here, multimedia, that's going to need to be played and shown throughout the course of the trial. Instead of walking back and forth and doing it, Sort of no, it, and that's what we do every day in this courtroom. Right, and that's what that's what he does every day in courtrooms as well. I mean, I, I'll, we're all we're asking for is an accommodation exactly like the Commonwealth has. It's just easier for us if I'm up on a cross examination or Mr. Yanetti is up on a cross examination, and we say, okay, if let's say we've got internal bait stamps that show number <laughs> photograph number two thirty one, he'll know what photograph number two thirty one is. He'll have an outline that that tracks our cross-examination or a direct examination. So it will be only things that are in evidence or will be coming into evidence? You're not going to do that with disputed? Absolutely not. We would never do that. If there's anything that's disputed or any it, it, even remotely controversial, my habit and practice is to ask to approach the bench. We all walk up. I say, this is what I'm proposing to show the jury, and the court rules on it. But no, it would, it, all it is is just a sort of a facile accommodation of seamlessly showing uh, multimedia to the, or playing an audio or playing a video for the jurors. All right, what's uh, the Commonwealth's position on this? Uh, Your Honor, given that representation, I mean, that's, that's precisely what, what we do in every case in which we have either Ms. Gilman or Ms. Crawford or whoever uh, assisting with the trial. If that's what it's limited to, I just, I don't know, um, no, about the, the additional monitors or, or things of that nature, whether or not, especially if we're going to be in courtroom 25, whether that's really necessary. Um, but certainly whatever logistically we have as far as uh, equipment uh, or screens or whatever is, is obviously fully, um, we would fully make accessible to defense counsel as well. 
as we do in every case. All right. So, you know, in, in Suffolk County, there are monitors. The, the audiovisual equipment is fantastic. There are the jury seats um, there for everybody to see. There's even a way if something is um, an objected to motion, it can just be seen on the lawyer's screen and the judge's. So the bottom line is, if we had known about this two months ago, we would have been able to really put the time into seeing exactly how this works. Ms. Tinetti, I'd like to finish first, and I'll give you the opportunity to I'm speak sorry. to Mr. Jackson, to really see how this works, see how we set it up. I, I can't devote that time to it right now. I don't, no monitors, no, uh, I don't want a monitor, I'm not allowing, or Madam Court Reporter is fine. We're in that very small courtroom now at your request, so we don't need monitors on the tables. I don't have the time to physically go see how this all looks. Um, Ms. Gilman's here, perhaps she can speak with your audio-visual person and then you can all make a presentation to me. But again, this, you know, months ago would have been much better. Well, I understand the court's uh, concern. This is extremely modest and it's not going to up, it's not going to take a whole lot of presentation. If the court doesn't want to monitor, the court says, I don't want to monitor. I don't know if I want monitors on those tables so close to the jury. That's fine. Then the court can say, I don't want monitors that close to the jury. Then what I would do is just use paper copies. Um, when I'm up on, on direct or cross-examination, I don't want to have to. I can't prepare with the Commonwealth's. No, I, I, under, I understand that. Um, I don't think he'll fit a counsel table. I, I can't speak to that. I, I think he would. I think we could accommodate him. Um, or if, if, if he doesn't fit right at council table, we've also set up, he was on, on a, a relatively large case that we had in a small courtroom back in California, and he's set up just behind council table, and he's got his own laptop, and nobody else can see it, and he's got a um, type of screen that you can't see it from angles, so jurors are not going to be seeing anything, but I need to be able to, and Ms. Little and Mr. Unetti need to be able to prepare with him and I think the court no, I, and I understand that. I don't. I don't have a problem with that. It's the the four monitors on the tables, one on the bench, then, one for the court. We won't, We're in a small room. And, we won't do that. And That's I'm it. concerned about the amplifying sound. I mean, it, is it like movie theater sound? I mean, it's again a tiny room at your request. He uses very modest speakers that are appropriate for the space. So, for instance, in this space it would be probably a, a couple of speakers that are larger so that the jurors can hear, the court can hear. In a small space, he'll just pare it down and use small speakers. And there's a switch. Uh, so for instance, he sets up, he will work with Commonwealth's AV expert, and there's a switch on both tables. Um, when it's my turn, switch, and now- All right, so, so is that switch, are you putting wires? I mean, these are all the things that I shouldn't be dealing with. To, I mean, we just got Wi-Fi in this building a week ago. I mean, it's not a building that I understand. You know, we can just last minute. It's a beautiful old historic building. We want to keep it that way. So, and we will not. We will not mess anything up. Uh, as a matter of fact, I was told that by the Commonwealth that she uses switches. Uh, you know, consistently. It's. It, that's not new technology. It's very simple. It just allows both of us to to be able to prepare with the audio visual portion of the case more seamlessly. That's all. We just want to make it more seamless and more professional for the court and for the jurors. That's so it. it would be during your case in chief? It, it, it would be during my cross-examination cross of every one of the witnesses. I mean, the bulk of the case is going to be the Commonwealth's case in chief. All right. With exhibits that are already into evidence, you're not trying to exi enter exhibits during cross-examination? I mean, unless it's an impeachment that I didn't see coming. But even in that case, my habit and practice, my custom and practice would be to approach, if it's a, a matter in controversy, or tell the Commonwealth in advance, I'm about to show this photograph. Do you have any issue with it? No, I don't. And then we'll show it. But I, I would never, the, the point of it is not to, to ambush anybody. It's just to make the, what is going to be shown and what's allowed to be shown seamless and more professional looking. Does the Commonwealth and Ms. Gilman have an opportunity to spend a little time today to take a look at it and see? I mean, everybody's preparing for trial, obviously. Again, this is, um, I don't have the time to do it. And I understand if you don't, but. 
I, I think Ms. Gilman can spend some time. She actually had made arrangements to meet Mr. Bates here last Friday, and he didn't appear when we asked, we were told he was going to be here. So, um, but I'm happy to have Ms. Gilman. Ms. Gilman, are you willing to spend some time today? Thank you. By the way, just on Mr. Bates's defense, yes, he was supposed to come last Friday. He was told he couldn't come because he hadn't gotten permission from this court yet. Okay. We did not. Well, that, that, makes, that makes sense, frankly. I, I just don't want there to be a sort of a hanging chad where that's concerned. He, he didn't leave. Well, before. especially where he didn't start out well, right? Being a council table during impanelment. I understand that. And, and he's been told that that was inappropriate and obviously would never happen again. All right. So some sort of ground rules. Um, only one counsel, whoever's doing the cross-examination of the witness, objects. Just one, not all of you. It's not a tag team. Um, so one person objects. If you want to approach the witness, you must ask permission. Um, at sidebar, there will only be one person talking again, and it'll follow with whoever does the examination. Many times I allow counsel to discuss things, uh, and many times I call directly on maybe appellate counsel uh, or counsel who's been the big law person. Uh, so you can ask me for permission for that. And no basis for your objection. You just simply object. That's it. And if we need to see you at sidebar, we'll see you at sidebar. But I don't want a whole litany of reasons why the testimony you think is inadmissible. So those are pretty standard rules. I'd like to see counsel at sidebar regarding a jury issue. Just a More raw courtroom coverage of the trial of Karen Reed is coming up from True Crime Today and the Hidden Killers podcast. Press subscribe so you don't miss a minute.